So we'll get started with today's lecture. We're taking a bit of a departure today into a little bit of a different topic, but this can be used um, on assignment two. So there was a couple of slides on the last lecture about assignment two that said you could use something like a, a hash table to implement the close list for a much more efficient lookup. Rather than iterating through a list to find a member, you could make a hash table um, to do that. It turns out that there are a lot of places in AI where you might want to use a hash table. Um, and in order to implement a hash table, which is essentially just an efficient data structure to be able to look up something, um, you're going to need to know a hash, what a hash function is. Um, so in order to implement a hash table, you could, of course, use a built-in one. But you know, this is computer science. We should know how it works a little bit more. So let's have a lecture on that. And this is an example of a, a lecture that may not be directly applicable to assignment work, but will be applicable later on if you're actually doing real AI stuff, and therefore applicable to a midterm exam. So, First of all, what is a hash function? So a hash function is used to map data of an arbitrary size, typically to data of a fixed size. And if I give a definition like this, I will give examples as we go in the slides. Um, so for example, if I want to take someone's name, and I'm sure not everyone's name in here is the same length of string, um, and so we can take a name which is of an arbitrary length and turn that into an integer of a given size, for example. So values that are returned by hash functions are called hash values, hash sums, or hashes. So if you've ever heard of a hash value or a hash or a hash sum, that's what it is. You take data that could be as big as you want or as small as you want, run it through some sort of function, and you typically get some value that's of a fixed size. And hash values are commonly used as an index into a lookup table or a hash table. So one of the ways that you can implement an efficient data structure is going to be, for example, an array. And so in order to look up something in an array, you need to have an index. So you can take some data, turn it into an integer, and then maybe use that integer as the index into your array. So just some examples of that. Um, we could have different length strings. And then we could take this, um, for example, fox, run it through a hash function, get some value. Um, run this string through a hash function, get some value. Run this thing through a hash function, get some value. What this down here um, illustrates is that with different types of hash functions, we may or may not want this property where a small change, so for example, the red fox runs across the ice versus the red fox walks across the ice, that's a relatively small change in comparison to the length of the overall data, but that can produce two hash values that are completely different. Okay, so that may be useful in some cases. It may be a detriment in other cases. So when might we want to use hash functions? Well, it's not just data lookup. Um, so, but one of the main reasons would be this sort of data retrieval example. So it can be used to quickly find data by computing an index or a key for a hash table. Right? So let's say you were trying to implement like a phone book right? and you're trying to look up your friend's phone number. Well, you could just have an array that you continuously grow, but then if you have a million numbers in it, what are you going to do then? You're going to say, OK, I'll look through every number that I've stored, compare the name, see if it's the right name, and then return the number. Or you could run that name through a hash table, compute an index, and look it up right away. Another example would be data protection. Um, so for example, if you are writing any sort of system that a user has to log into, it is very bad practice to store the password in plain text, meaning that if my password is like Dave rules, right, and I type in my password, you have to be able to authenticate that password somewhere in your system. So you have a database somewhere, and a plain text password storage would mean that somewhere in a database, in a file, would be my password, Dave rules, spelled out in, in, perfect, uh, in perfect English. However, in that case, if someone ever hacked you and got your database, then they would know the passwords. And that's the opposite of what you want. So typically what's done is the second um, layer here of data protection, or the second example, 
Um, instead of storing the password directly, we would take the password, run that through a hash function, and then store the result of the hash function. And so the way we would then authenticate is when you type in your password, whatever you typed in, I run it through a hash function, and then I compare the result of that to the hash that we have stored in the database. And so that way, if someone looks up, or if someone steals the entire database, yes, they have the hashed versions of the passwords, but they don't have the passwords themselves, which is much more secure. And you know, this is an over, oversimplification of it. There are extra steps that go on there. But what it means is that hashing can be used as a form of protection of your data in that sense. It can also be used as data verification. So one thing that used to be true, um, so, oh wow, has anyone here ever, not to like, this isn't like ageism or anything, but has anyone here besides me ever had dial-up internet? Okay, a couple of people. I'm very surprised that a couple of people have had dial-up internet. But, yeah, so my first internet was on like a 2800 baud modem. It took me 90 minutes to download a three, three megabyte MP3, right? So after 90 minutes, I wanted to make sure that the file that I got was actually the file that I wanted. So what they would do, and still do for things like Linux ISOs or other large files, is that if you go to download like a big file, Linux ISO, other, other large files, typically you'll be able to download the file itself, which may be you know, a DVD in size, so a few gigabytes, but then also a relatively small hash of that file. So what happens is they run the data of the file through a hash function and store the result, which is a pretty small integer in, com in comparison to the hash function, and then when you download that large file, well, how would I be able to know that the file that I got is the exact file that you sent me? Right? So any number of things could go wrong. I could miss a bit, a bit could get flipped from some cosmic ray, some hacker man in the middle attack could change the data. But if I also, once I get the file, if I run it through the same hash function that you used and then compare my hash to your hash, that's another way of verifying that the file that I got is actually the file that I wanted to get. And so in, back in the day, this was used much more often because file transfers were much slower, but it's still used. And some data transfers have this built into it where both the host and the client will both hash the values and then compare the hashes to make sure that the data you got was the data you sent. Now, of course, there's a possibility that the hashing two different values would give you, or two different sets of data would give you the same hash value, but it's like, it's so improbable with modern hash functions that it's basically impossible. Um, another one would be called geometric hashing, and geometric hashing is what you would want to do on assignment two. So it is used for many proximity-based problems in computational geometry, but in your case for assignment two, you would want to take an xy location and turn that into an integer index into an array, for example. Now for assignment two, you can get around this problem because you can just use a 2D array, so you can store it directly there. But in general, you would want to take some n-dimensional geometric data and reduce that to a one-dimensional index into an array. So that's another use. Container membership query. So this is what we are really interested in, right? So one of the problems that takes a while, if you haven't done something like this, might be to say something like, is this in the closed list? Right? So is the state that I have, is that a member of the closed list? So open and closed list membership is one of the most common queries in our search. It happens at least once every iteration of our search. And so how you store the open and closed list matters for membership query, right? The data structure that you use to look up something may have a different running time for querying whether or not it's part of that data structure. So if we use just a, like a naive list or array, something that we would have to iterate through, then if it has n elements in the list or array, then that would be O of n membership query, because in the worst case, we would have to check everything one by one. If you have a set or a dictionary, a modern, well-implemented set or dictionary, that would be a log n lookup time, so we could have like a binary tree or something like that. A hash table um, would have O of n in the worst case, and we'll talk about that a bit more when we get into the, the hash tables. But for a perfect hash table, we would have O of 1 for the worst case, meaning that we would have a constant time lookup 
for, um, for our data. So it turns out that if you can take your environment and perfectly map it into an array of that exact size, like we can for assignment two, then that would be called a perfect hash table. And so we would be able to set and get values of the close list instantaneously without having to do things like look them up in a dictionary, et cetera. So now that we know what a hash function is, what is a hash table? Um, so to hash a data structure means to represent it in another form, right? Usually we go to integers. Um, typically hashing is done by a function that turns a, some data structure or file or amount of data into a number. And integers are preferred as the output for many, many different reasons. Um, one of them is because computers store and handle integers much more efficiently than other types of data like floating point values. Um, so yeah, they can be stored and manipulated in many ways. And since they are whole number integers, we can also use them to index into an array, which is like one of the best benefits. And so this array that you would use to index by a hash function is called a hash table. If we have a given hash function, it's going to expect data in a given format, right? Even if we have a completely generic hash function that you can say, give me any type of file, it's still going to expect, okay, this is like, uh, I'm gonna read it one bit at a time, or maybe eight bits, or one byte at a time, or, or a gigabyte at a time, or whatever. So if we have any function, not just hash functions, we have to have some data format that we give into it, of course. Um, some hash functions can also only work on a specific range of values for a particular input format. So for example, some very specific hash function may say, I can only work on integer values uh, that are uh, below 32 bits or below whatever amount of bits. Um, hashing an unexpected input value or a value from outside of an expected range may produce bad results or completely undefined results. Okay, so just keep in mind that just like any function, you have to be very specific sometimes about the type of data that's passed in. So for example, we may want to hash a string into an integer. And if we passed in something other than a string, you know, we would get something that we don't want. A hash function is going to take in some values and then produce values in a predefined format um, and range. So, for example, um, I'm going to produce a value that's between 0 and 100, or 0 and a million, or 0 and 32 bits, whatever that number happens to be. And the range is very important for the output of a hash function because it's often used, like I said before, as the index for a table or an array. And so if you have a table of a specific size, you know, would you want the index that you produce to be larger than that size? Well, sometimes it is. And integers are often convenient for that because we can use the modulus operator to control the output range. So modulus is like the shift five percent sign. If you've never used it before, it's, essentially, it's essentially the remainder after division. Okay, so that's the modulus operator. I'll show you how that's work, uh, used in a little bit. Some properties on hash functions. So just like we had properties on search algorithms, we also have properties on hash functions. So determinism, um, typically, a good hash function should not be random, right? Because we're looking for data verification, data um, protection, so we want to make sure that like, the same input is going to give us the same output. Um, that's just, there's very few cases that I can think of, and I can't actually think of any right now, where I would want the result of a hash function to be randomized, right? Like, wh why would you ever want that? Um, also, uniformity is an important property. So a good hash function maps inputs as evenly as possible over its output range, and that prevents hash collisions and also um, improves security, right? So if my hash function could produce any number between one and a billion, but for some reason, if you pass in the letter A somewhere, it always produces the result of one million, that would, that would be weird, right? We would want that any hash function, or sorry, the hash function taking in any input would produce essentially a random value within this, um, sorry, 
not a random value, but a uniform value. So we would have an equal chance of getting any value in that output range. And that output range, um, it's desired, <laughs> desirable to have a defined output range um, because we want to know what range these numbers will be put into, right? So typically, uh, if you go and you find a hashing program for like hashing files, for example, like I said before, you know, you pass a file into a hash function, it'll give you a hash value that you can compare. Well, for example, one of the earliest ones I ever used was called CRC32. And so CRC was the name of the hash function. I won't get into the details of that hash function. But essentially what it said was, no matter what size of data that you give me, I'm going to produce a 32-bit integer as the output. So that's the CRC32. Typically nowadays, you're not going to use a 32-bit hash function. You would get something that's at least like 256 bits, just for security. Data normalization. Sometimes um, your input data is going to contain features that are kind of irrelevant. Um, sometimes those features are relevant, sometimes they're not. So for example, maybe if you're doing something like, I don't know, machine learning, and your user is typing in a sentence that you want to, um, to store somewhere, whatever, for some context, maybe you don't care if they capitalize the first letter or capitalize their name or alternated capitals. It's the content of the sentence that you're looking for. So sometimes hash functions can do that where they take in data and they normalize it in some form so that you don't need to worry about those types of things in the inputs. Continuity. Do small changes in the input values have small changes in the output? So sometimes we would want that. Other times we would not want that. So for example, if I had an environment that I was doing some AI in and I wanted to store some value related to this particular XY location, right? So I, I hash that XY location, I get an integer. Maybe if I was doing the same thing for the next cell, for example, something very close to that, I would want the hash value to be very close to the hash value of another one. So I could store that data maybe contiguously in memory or something like that. But other times, for example, in cryptography or security, we don't want that to be the case at all. So if I had a password that was 1,000 characters long and I just changed one of those characters, I would want the output to be completely different so that they couldn't gather a bunch of typo hashes and then compare them and maybe reverse engineer my password, for example. Also, reversibility. Um, some hash functions can be inverted. So we can obtain the input back from the given output. This may be desired. So for example, if you were storing your closed list like this, you would want to be able to go back, OK, this is the index in my closed list. I would want to be able to translate that input, the, sorry, that index, which is the output of the hash function, back into the state of the environment. Right? So not only could I hash this x, y into an integer, but I could take the integer and turn it back into the original x, y. So that's an example where we would want to do something like that. But maybe you don't want to do something like that, and the obvious case is like a password hash, right? So the whole point of storing the hash is that you can't get the password. So if the password hashing function was invertible, meaning you could get back to the password, then what's the point in hashing it in the first place? So you don't want it in that case. Um, Non-invertible functions are also called one-way hash functions. One way meaning we can get from the data to the hash, but we can't get back from the hash to the data. So what are some different algorithms that we could use to hash something? Well, literally any function that you write which takes data and produces other data could be considered a hash function. So let's just get that out of the way. You can write whatever you want for a hash function. But there's certain types, like classes, I guess, of hash functions that we should talk about. The first one you might think of as a trivial hash function. So this is when typically small data can be directly translated into its hashed value. So a good example of this is uh, ASCII characters. Anyone worked with ASCII character number values before? So like, you know, an A, lowercase a in ASCII is represented. So if you have most programming languages like C or C++, um, many programming languages can turn that character, right, char, whatever, that's literally just storing an integer underneath. And then when it's printed to your screen, 
they look up that integer in an array of values of pixels to display and then display the pixels associated with that value. So I think in ASCII, a lowercase a is 65. And then you know that b must be 66 and c must be 67, et cetera. So that's the trivial case where your data is already sort of represented as an integer. There's another case called perfect hash functions, um, which are injective and bijective functions, and I'll talk about those properties in a second, um, where each possible input maps uniquely to a value in the output range. And this is called a one-to-one -one function. So I talked about these. Let's look at those, those properties. Um, injective. So an injective function, and I know that you've probably seen uh, these properties before, even in like high school when talking about functions, but they start to mean something different when you associate them with data and security, so it's nice to, to actually review this. So injective function means that each input maps uniquely to an output. Some, uh, some output values may be unmapped, and many injective functions can be made invertible, but not necessarily all of them. And I'll, I'll have a diagram of, like, a visual example of this in a bit. For a surjective function, for every possible output value y, there is at least one input value x, such that f of x equals y. Many surjective functions are not invertible. Bijective means that the input and output functions map uniquely. So from math, this is one to one and onto. Um, you've probably heard that phrase before. And this would be a minimal perfect hash function. So let's look at some uh, graphical examples. Over here on the left, you, you can see this. Um, they call this like the, the, func the injective function test. So if I have a function, if I draw a line horizontally across the function, if no matter where I draw that line, it touches exactly one spot, then that is injective. Okay? If multiple x values map to the same y value, then that is not injective. Similarly, over here, if we're talking about a hash function, then over here, whatever hash function we used turned John Smith into index 2, and also Sandra D turned into index 2. And so they do not map uniquely, so it's not injective. So here's a, a completely stolen from Wikipedia example, um, over, but educational purposes, right? So it's OK. Um, over here, we have inputs, x, and we have outputs, y. And whatever our function is doesn't really matter. We're just talking about the properties of that function. Actually, let me go back to the on-screen laser pointer so the video watchers can get this as well. So over here, we have x's. Those are the inputs, y's, which are the outputs. If we look here, each x value maps uniquely to an output y value. So no y value is mapped to by two different x values. So this is an injective function. Now, is it surjective? Surjective means that every possible output value has an x value which maps to it. And so no, the c has no value that maps to it, and so this is non-surjective. Over here, we have an injective surjective function. This is also called a bijection, because it goes both ways. And so here, each of our x values maps uniquely to a y value. And in order to have this be surjective as well, both sets have to be the same size. Okay, so we have a unique mapping from each element of x to an element of y. Over here, this value is surjective because each y value is mapped to by an x value, but it's not injective because multiple, here we have three and four, these both map to the same y value. And over here, the last example, um, if both of these map to the same y value, then it is not injective. And if we have a y value which is not mapped to by anything in x, then it's not surjective. And so if I tell you um, on an exam, uh, if I give you this, this one right here, say, is it surjective, is it injective, that's a possible question. Or I could say, uh, give me an example of an injective but not surjective function and tell you to draw a diagram that sort of looks like that, OK? Here is an example of modulus hashing. So modulus hashing is very, very simple. It is typically used as the final step 
where we take an integer value and then we use that as, a, as the index to a, to a table. And so in modulus hashing, we basically just take one integer and then mod it by n. Um, so for example, if the output of our hash function was a value between one and 100, or sorry, one and 1,000, but our hash table, our array, only had 10 entries in it, then we have to somehow take that value which could be one to 1,000 and turn it into a value which is between one and 10. So one of the ways of doing that would be with modulus. So we can just divide and then uh, take the remainder. And so this acts as a sort of truncation. So it only cares about the lower order bits. So what that means is if we take 1,000 and mod it by 10, what do we keep? Well, we keep the ones place of that original number. See how that works? So if I take 1,007 and mod it by 10, well, you're taking 1,007 and dividing it by 10, then taking the remainder, which is just 7, which is the ones place of the original number. Now, that example is a little bit cherry-picked because 1,000 is divisible by 10, and they're, they're both in base 10, but um, this would be also true of other examples. But be careful of uniformity if x is not a multiple of n. So for example, if we took an output hash function which produced numbers in the range of 1 to 15 and mapped that into 1 to 10, then there would be some values in 1 to 10 that got an extra value from that 1 to 15. See what I'm saying? So like five of those numbers, maybe 1 to 10 mapped to 1 to 10, but then 11 maps to 1, 12 maps to 2, 13 maps to 3, and so we would have the first half, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 would have two possible values that map to them, and then 6, 7, 8, 9, yeah, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 would only have one possible value that maps to it, and so that would not be a very uniform distribution. So if uniformity is desired, then keep that in mind when you, when you create your function. Another way to do this to turn one number into a smaller number is to use what's called binning. So instead of taking the lower order bits with modulus, you take the higher order bits by just doing division. And so if we wanted to go from, again, from 1,000 into 10, let's say we just divide by 10, right? So 921 divided by 10, now that we'd, oh, sorry, geez, you can't divide by, if we had 10 things, we would have to divide by 100, not by 10. So if we took 921 and divided it by 100, that would give us 9. So with modulus, we keep the lower order bits. With division, we keep the higher order bits, so the hundreds place instead of the ones place. And so these are just examples, but they're examples that show this hashing function is actually taking data from different parts of the number. So if that matters for whatever reason, just keep that in mind. Let's look at an example now of how I might hash a string, okay? So let's take my name, Churchill, and we will hash that, and we will throw out, oh, so yeah, I am hashing this, and the function I am going to use to hash my name is just to sum the ASCII character values. So over here, you can see all the decimal representations of the ASCII values of all the values of my name, and I can sum them all, and I get 926. And this is actually case sensitive, okay, because we're using ASCII values. So what are the summation properties? Is it injective? Is it surjective? Okay, well, injective means that inputs map uniquely to outputs. So just give a, give a hand, not, not a, sorry, applause, raise your hand if you think that this function is injective, okay? Raise your hand if you think it's not injective, okay? Uh, why don't you think it's injective? Did someone so happen to have the name like Chill Urch? Yep, great name, yep. Okay, so you, you've identified the problem here, which is that just summing the character values, the order of those characters has no, no bearing in it, right? I could reverse it, I could randomize it, they would all have the exact same summation. So if I was using this value, this function, 
to hash my passwords, for example, then as long as someone typed the characters of my password, but possibly in the wrong order, then I'd say, great, log in, right? And so that wouldn't be very good. What about um, surjective, meaning are all of the possible output values reachable from some input value? Anyone think it is? I think you're thinking. What are you thinking? Probably. Probably. I mean, that one is, is I'm pretty sure most of you were thinking yes, right? Because any possible output value, any integer, you could come up with a string that sums to that value. It might be really long or really short, but you could get to every integer. Now, OK, technically, with the ASCII values, maybe the lowest possible ASCII value is 65, so you can't get to those. But you know what I'm saying. I would consider this to be surjective, because you can get to basically any integer um, by using this. The distribution. So does the distribution of this, is it uniform? It turns out that this is not necessarily uniformly distributed. It is more normally distributed. And I'm not going to get into like the proof of that or ask for a proof of that on an exam. But basically, if you take a bunch of random numbers and sum them up, you're going, and especially numbers from names, which typically draw from distributions of you know, whatever language you're using, this is more of a normally distributed thing than a, than a uniformly distributed thing. Uh, so that's, if it's important to be, nor, to be evenly distributed, this may not be the hash function for you. Is this reversible? Can you get from a number back to a name? Okay, so I see a bunch of head shaking. That one's pretty obvious, right? Um, if I took the string AB and hashed it, then BA would also produce that, right? So there are many, infinitely many, possibly, um, input strings that would um, map to the same output string. And so you definitely could not reverse this. However, if you do have things that are like English words, for example, what you could do is go through and pre-compute a bunch of hash values for commonly used English words and then even though technically any string could have produced something, if I see 926 somewhere and the data happens to be related to this class, it might be Churchill, right? So you could use it to glean some statistical information that may be used in like brute forcing password attacks or whatever, even though it's not a reversible hash function. The data can still give you things that you may not want people to have. And if we already talked about this, but in this particular hash function, the input order of the characters does not matter because I'm just summing them. So there are different ways of, of going about solving this problem, and I'm not going to drill down into exactly how all of these more secure hash functions work, but one of them, one of the ways that they do it is to do something called block summation. So in take, instead of taking every character, we take blocks of certain amounts of characters at a time. And so um, we could interpret that as a single long int. So for example, if I took C-H-U-R and I took the bits and just lined them up, that would produce this number. C-H-I-L would, would produce this number. L would produce this number. Then the hash would be this. And if I wanted to store that in my hash table of size 1,000, I would take that number and then mod it by 1,000. But of course, as you can probably think, well, now, if it was chill churl, it would still produce the same value because the order of the blocks doesn't matter, right? So you would then maybe do something that orders the blocks and you get more and more complicated. And essentially what exists in the world now are hash functions that are super efficient. They're mathematically sound. If you change one value somewhere, the resulting hash function changes. They're implemented in hardware. So there's probably some chip in my phone that does hashing really efficiently for security purposes. And so this problem is one that is, I wouldn't say it's like perfectly solved, but it, there are lots of great hash functions out there um, that do good things. Another example would be geometric hashing. And this is directly related to assignment two. So let's say I have um, a one-dimensional hash table um, 
just an array with, with indices in one dimension. And so in our assignment grid, we have a 2D array. So what we would want to be able to do here, if we, let's say, we pretend we couldn't store a two-dimensional array, right? So I would want to take the index of a 2D array and somehow convert that from an x comma y, like 5 comma 4, into a single integer. How might I do that? So the input would be two integers, x and y, and the output would be one integer, i, for the index. Here's one way of doing that. So my function could be, uh, if I have x as the width and y as the height, if I take y times width plus x, then this maps every possible x and y input to a unique output in that range. Okay? So for example, um, I don't have a, a grid here which I normally would pull up, but if I had, in your, in, your, in your assignment, you have like a grid with 64 cells by 64 cells. So if you think of how you, as a human, would assign a unique integer to each of those cells, you might say something like, okay, let's just start counting from the top left. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to 63. And then you say, okay, the next row starts at 64. 65, 66, 67, blah, blah, blah. And then you go to 128. 129, 130, you know, you keep, so every new row, you'd start a new 64, and that's what this function does, is it takes the row column index, the xy index, and turns it into a single integer. And so each xy is mapped into a single integer, and that integer is also reversible. So if I want the y value, I can divide i by the width, and if I want the x value, I can mod i by the width. Okay, so that's how I can take that that integer value and get back to um, the xy value. And so for A star in assignment two, if you want to, you can use a 1D Boolean array, meaning just like trues and falses, as the closed list. But you can also just use a 2D array, so I would say do that. It's a lot easier than computing these indices. Any questions about anything? Next, we have to talk about hash collisions. As we said already many, many times, one of the reasons we want to hash data into an integer would be to use it as an index to a hash table. Or we could also think of like hashing for data um, verification, where I'm taking a file and producing a single value from that file. If an array of size n is used, the hash function typically finishes with a mod n operation. A hash collision occurs when two inputs produce the same hash output, causing a collision inside the hash table. So what do I mean by this? Over here, for example, um, we have John Smith. We've run that through some hash function, and that might produce the integer value of two. So inside our array that we're using for our hash table, the John Smith data would be stored in index two. Uh, Lisa Smith would hash over into index number one. Sam Doe would hash into index number four. But then when we, in, when we hash Sandra D, uh-oh, there's already something at that place in the hash table. And so because there was already something there and we're wanting to go there, that is a collision. It turns out that CRC32 algorithm that I talked about before, even though there are 32 bits or four-ish billion possible output values, people have found some English words, of which there are only a couple of hundred thousand, which actually have a hash collision. So the, if you are without plums, you are plumless, right? So plumless, if you run it through CRC32, produces this hash value. And buckaroo, so if you're really into cowboys, um, if you have cowboys without plums, you may be, you know, you may have a problem if you're using CRC32 for your hash functions. So both plumless and buckaroo, which are valid English words, both produce the same hash value. So CRC32, that's one of the reasons it's not used anymore um, in any actual secure setting, because it is not, it's not a great hash function. 
And partially, it's because it's only 32 bits. If it was 64 bits, maybe it would produce unique values for all English words or whatever. But the question here is, if the two values collide, how are we going to store their hash values or their values in the hash table? Are we just going to say, OK, Sandra, sorry, I don't want your phone number? Or are we going to say, uh, well, Sandra is most recent, so maybe I'll delete John's phone number? Right? What, what am I going to do when I, when I, when I, um, when I see this? There are solutions, but they are all expensive, either in memory or time. So it's always a trade-off, right? You can do something, but it could be expensive. But before we get into possible solutions, let's talk about what is the probability of a hash function occurring? So who's heard of the birthday problem in terms of what is the probability with n people where two people have the same birthday, right? So you may think, you know, oh, well, the probability is probably pretty high once you get to about 300 people because there's 300 days, right? However, it turns out that if you have 365 days in the year, which we do, there is a 50% probability that two people have the same birthday at only 23 people. So I'm not going to you know, ask everyone their birthdays, but there's a greater than 50% chance that two people in this room have the same birthday. And that's not intuitive, right? It's really not. But here's why that is. It's because, let's take my birthday. Let's, let's just give everyone increasing values of birthday. So my birthday, January 1st, right? It's not actually, but. Now, if I go to see if there's anyone else with that birthday, right? So maybe your birthday has a 1 in 365 chance of being the same as my birthday, right? But now we have two different birthdays. So it wasn't two different birthdays. Now your birthday has a 2 in 365 chance of being the same as one of the birthdays. That's, a, that's, doubly, that's double the previous chance, right? Yours has 3 in 365, 4 in 465, 5 in 565. By the time we get up to 23, that's almost like 10% with each person. So by 23, that value becomes greater than 50%. And an approximate rule, so with each new hash, the probability of hitting a previous hash rises. And it rises pretty quickly. It's like quadratically rising. And so you have, a, you know, a, it's not exact, but a pretty good rule is you take the square root of the output range, so 365 in this case, and you have a 50% chance of a collision, meaning the same birthday, at approximately the square root of the output range. So the square root you might think it's like, you know, it would be half. So, okay, we have a 50% chance with 180 people, but no, that's much, much lower. Square root is a much lower number. So if you have a 32-bit integer, which is 4 billion values, you're like, I'm never going to run out of values. I'm not going to even come close to storing 4 billion things. Well, you already have a 50% chance of having a hash collision at only 70,000 hashes. And so that's not a lot, if you think about it. And that's a 50% chance. Do you want a 50% chance of your thing just failing? Probably not, right? Um, and if you want a 99% chance, you only have to go to 250,000 hashes. So it rises very, very quickly, and hash collisions are much more common than our human brains would, would intuitively think that they are. So hash tables. Um, also called a hash table or a lookup table, a data structure that associates some data with values via a key or identifier. So if we have a hash function which turns data into a key, then our hash table would take as the index the key and store some value there. Um, the reason I'm going over this again is because I'm about to talk about hash resolution, hash collision resolution, and I just wanted to have this slide here as a reminder. Uh, the most common way to do this is as an array, but you can have dictionaries that are actually like tree representations, all sorts of different things. I'm just talking about um, this way. Uh, Python built-in dictionaries, I believe, use hash tables, um, which are pretty fast for the most part. Hash tables could also 
serve as a cache to store relatively expensive computations. If you end up doing this, this practice is called memoization. So let's say that you have a program and computing some value on a particular input is going to take like a minute, but maybe you don't have a, a large range of inputs that you're ever calculating something for. So I could store the values of previous computations in a hash table, and then when I go to compute the value for a new thing, I could look it up to see if it's in the hash table. Um, so hash tables enable programs to use additional memory to gain speed. And ideally, hash table query time, meaning looking up something in a hash table, is independent of the number of things in that hash table. But as we'll see, that depends on your hash collision resolution scheme, which I'll give a few examples of. So here's a little bit of an example from Python of memoization. Uh, it's just one way that you can automatically Im implement memoization into a class or a function, which is really interesting. So if you have a function that you want to memoize, you wrap it in a class, you have a memo, self.memo is a dictionary, and whenever you call that function, what it first does is it checks to see if the arguments to the function already have an answer in the dictionary. If they do, return the answer that you already computed. Otherwise, you can just return the newly computed answer. Oh, sorry, that's the opposite way around. If it's not there, compute it. Otherwise, return the, the answer that you had before. So if we're doing factorial, this is actually really, really cool because factorial depends on the result of previous factorials. And so after you've done a few factorial calls, you'll have a bunch of them stored. And then let's say I do um, 100 factorial. In order to get 100 factorial, I would need to have done 50 factorial at some point. So then if I call 50 later, it'll just say, oh, I already have the answer for that, so just return that. So this is just one cool thing that you can do um, with, with hash tables if they're implemented quickly. The reason we want to implement hash tables as a one-dimensional array, typically, is because one-dimensional arrays are, in some programming languages, others it's not guaranteed, but this memory is going to be contiguous, right? So if it's contiguous memory, meaning that all my data for this index is stored in memory right next to the next index, et cetera, et cetera, then when I go to look up that data, some of it is already in the cache, which is super fast, et cetera. So each, think of each index um, in the hash table as a bucket, and our job is to put things, data, into buckets. So again, the, the easiest example to, to, to think of is a phone book, right? So we have names. Man, that saw is annoying. What are you going to do? Hopefully it's not on the recording. So John Smith um, you know, would map into this, and we want to store John Smith's phone number. right? So we'd make a hash table dictionary to do this, or a hash table phone book to do this. John Smith's phone number is stored over here. Lisa Smith is stored over here. Sandra Dees is stored over here, et cetera, et cetera. So we may want to ask ourselves when we're, at, when we're storing or creating a hash table, what data do we actually want to store in our hash table? Um, typically, if it's a phone book, for example, we would also want to store the original input as a key value pair. So we wouldn't want to just store the phone number. We would store the name and the phone number in that, um, in that area. What you, what you choose to store, is completely up to your particular um, use case. And so the stored values depend entirely on the application. So just remember, real quickly, these properties that we have, right? Functions that look like this are bad for hash tables, right? Because this means that collisions can occur. But it turns out that that's going to be the vast majority of hash tables where collisions can occur. One more. Um, thing that we need to talk about is the load factor of a hash table. So load factor is defined as n over k, where n is the number of entries in the table and k is the total number of entries. So for example, if we had 100 spaces for data in our hash table and we had 10 things in the hash table, that would have a load factor of 100 Oh, sorry, no, that's, I just said the opposite. 
n is the number of things that we have, and k is the total number. So if we had 100 possible locations for things, that would be the k. And if we had 10 things in it, that would be 1 or 10 over 100, so 10%. So it's essentially how full is it, right? It's 10% full. That's the load factor. Typically, the performance of a hash table is going to de decrease with increasing load factor because as we get a higher and higher load factor, there's less space to put things there, and so our chance of a collision occurs. So hash collisions. A bijective function with table size equal to the input size means we would have no collisions. So, for example, on assignment two, you are lucky to have a case of a bijective hash function for your closed list because you can directly translate your xy's into an index in an array. And you can have that array be the exact same size. So there's a perfect mapping from one xy into an index and vice versa. But in practice, this doesn't happen very often. If you're thinking about hashing arbitrary data like a phone book, there's many names that will probably index into the same index or hash into the same index. And that's because the input range is typically much bigger than your table size. Can I possibly store a table that's the same size as the number of names in the world? OK, well, it's 7 billion, so maybe. But not the number of possible names, right? If you think possible strings. A hash collision occurs when the bucket for my new table entry is already occupied. So let's look at that. So a hash collision, again, is when the hash of one thing is equal to the hash of another thing. So the question is, what do we do with Sandra D? That could be the name of a book. Um, and how we resolve that is very important. And the strategy that we implement for resolution depends entirely on the hash table implementation. And most hash table implementations differ the most in their, um, in their way that they deal with hash table collisions. So the simplest possible solution, this is the first way that you could deal with data, is just to overwrite it. Sorry, John Smith, Sandra D's name came second, so we're going to overwrite. So it's just, if the bucket is already occupied, overwrite it. Some of the conditions for overwriting, maybe you have conditions on it. So for example, maybe you want to store the newest value, because for some reason in your program, the most recent value, maybe it's like a stock price. Why would you want to store the old stock price when you could store the new stock price? Right? Um, so maybe you want to store the oldest value or the deepest value in a search, et cetera. Maybe you want to store the minimum value or the maximum value, et cetera. So there's all sorts of ways that you could implement the overwriting option. So whatever happens to hash into this, we're going to overwrite one of them. We're either going to keep the old one or store the new one. It's, it's up to us. But this is just one example. But in practice, we lose way too much data this way. We're always going to be throwing out some data on a collision, and there's going to be lots of collisions, and so you lose too much data. Typically, we don't do this in practice. One of the easiest ways to not lose our data is to implement something called chaining. So instead of having each bucket in the hash table be a single value, now it's a list. So we can store multiple things in there. So we insert into the bucket, instead of overwriting John Smith with Sandra D, what we would do is that since this is a list, think of a linked list as the, the simplest possible example. Um, we can just add Sandra D onto the end of that list. There you go. I'm keeping all the values now. I'm not throwing anything out. If our hash function is relatively uniform, meaning that no matter what I pass in, there's a relatively equal chance that any of these integers will be produced, then I won't have that many hash collisions, right? Or if I do, um, each list will be as small as possible. If I had, for example, a, a hash function that always returned zero, then everything would be in the same list, and I may as well just use a list. So I, I do want it to be as uniform as possible. In the worst case, all I have is one huge list, and so this is pretty inefficient. It's an O of n query, right? I would have to look through that entire list to find the value that I want. But in practice, 
the average query time for a chaining hash resolution hash table is the average list size. Okay? If we only have one thing in each list, it's constant time. If we have two things in each list, then I'm going to have to check two things. And you, I'm, I'm saying here this is a list, but I could replace that with a set or a vector or any data structure which holds multiple things. But the issue with chaining that may be desirable, may not be desirable, depending on your use case, is that the hash table can grow beyond the initial array size, right? Because so I can get bigger than my initial array size, which I might want, I might not want. And so what we might look up, what we might look like eventually is something like this. Some of our um, hash table buckets could contain multiple items. Some of them can contain no items. Ideally, they would all have the exact same number of items, but in practice, you may not find that. So that's chaining. The next hash resolution strategy is called open addressing. In open addressing, all records are stored in the array. So we no longer have lists in each bucket. Everything is going to be stored in the array. Um, so there's no lists or external data structures. But, so what do we do if we're not overwriting? Well, this is what we do. If there's no collision, then we just insert it. But if there is a collision, we're going to scan forward in the array somehow. Okay, so just pick a new place to store it in the array. Then we're going to insert it into another open space in the array. But in order to do this, we're going to need some secondary key value for the lookup. And I'll show you what I, what I mean by this in a second. So when looking up an entry, we have to look at the original index. And if the second hash value is correct, then we return it. And we just scan forward with the given strategy until the second one is found. So here's an example. This is called linear probing. So linear probing is the type of open addressing that we're doing. So what we're going to do, so again, John Smith and Sandra D produced the same value. So we inserted John Smith first. We store John Smith and John Smith's data, which is the phone number. This is going to be our secondary key. Okay, so that name is something that we're going to use to make sure, is this John Smith that I'm looking up? Then what we do, we insert uh, Lisa Smith up here. No collision, that's fine. Then we insert Sam Doe down here. Sam, no collision, that's fine. Then I'm going to insert Sandra D. But Sandra D, of course, produced the same hash value as John Smith. So in linear probing, all I do is I go to the next bucket. And if the next bucket is free, that's where I put it. So that's what I did. I took Sandra D, and I put it in the next bucket. But maybe now I have Ted Baker. And so Ted Baker, well, that was 153. That would have been great if it wasn't for Sandra. But now what I have to do with Ted Baker is because I have a collision here, I have to go to the next one. So that's linear probing. So if it's empty, insert it. If blocked, go to the next one. And for inserting, we need a secondary key or we can't do lookup. What do I mean by that? Well, let's pretend that we didn't store the name here. When I went to look up Sandra D the next time, how could I tell that that's actually Sandra D's number? Right? I would just be looking up here and I'd say, OK, that's Sandra D's number, but that's actually John Smith's number. So when I do the lookup using open addressing, I have to, OK, look up Sandra D. Here we go. It's right here. First, look up to see if the names match. And if the names match, then I'm pretty certain that that's the number. If the names don't match, go to the next one. Do the same thing. So that is the hash resolution strategy for open addressing. OK, so this is what I just said, but it's, but it's typed out. So when I'm looking up into the hash table, look at the hash index. If the second key matches, then return the data. If not, go to the next. And repeat forward until the second key is matched when you return the value. So open addressing, probing strategies. Linear probing can suffer from clustering. So you can see here, if there's a match, then like this cluster here, wherever there's a collision, there's going to be a bunch of things around there, which means it's no longer very uniform. 
Um, so these few dense clusters result in slow lookups because they're essentially just chaining, right? So that would be that. So there are other possible strategies. So for example, you could take quadratic probing where maybe you, you go forward by one, then two, then four, then eight when you're looking up. You could do double hashing. So with double hashing, you produce two indices. And then if there's a collision, you may add the second hash rather than just going forward by one. And all these different open addressing strategies, they just help spread out um, values to avoid this clustering that happens with linear addressing. There's also another one called coalesced hashing. And they combine the ideas of chaining and open addressing. So the chain structure is used on a collision, but the chain points to buckets in the table. So instead of letting our, we'd still do chaining, except what we have to do is find a place in our hash table, probably using open addressing to put the next thing. But then what we would do is instead of just scanning forward, we would actually just point to the memory address or the index of where the next thing is stored. So rather than have to scan forward, scan forward, scan forward, this one would say, hey, this is the next thing up here. And that's, that's how that works. It has a bit better memory performance, but we suffer from the fact that now we can only store um, the size of the table, number of entries, which you may want. But if you use chaining, we could store more values. So, there's many, many other strategies. I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to show you these few so that you know when you are using a hash table, these things are happening behind the scenes. Okay? Why do we care about that so much in this course? Well, sometimes, especially in assignment three, we may want to store relevant information about game states. Sorry, I meant just assignment two, but also in assignment three. So for example, maybe, we want to know what we should do at a particular state. And if we've computed that, we want to store it some, somehow. So that might be a policy. Maybe ha we have a value or a heuristic or the result of a search. And what we want to do is be able to take a state and then store a value indexed by that state. And of course, we can't have a, a state of an environment be the index into an array. So we do that using a hash table. And so, there are some hash tables that are trivial, where states are simple. Those are called tabular, tabular data or tabular hash tables. So in assignment one and assignment two, the closed list is a very uh, easy example, where we take you know, one state's x, y value and just turn it into an integer and look that up. Um, they may be other tabular examples where it's slightly more complicated. So for example, in blackjack, um, you take this as a blackjack policy, a blackjack betting table. And what we want to be able to do if we were doing a blackjack program is say, if I have these cards and the dealer is showing that card, what should I do? And I want to be able to store that somehow. So this table, you would take, for example, if I have a pair of aces and the dealer has a seven, I would want to somehow take that information, I have a pair of aces, the dealer has a seven, and turn that into an index in this hash table. Okay, I'm not going to go into the function that does that, but you could probably think of one that would do it. And then I would store, oh, if that happens, I want to split. So that's the action that I would take for blackjack. We'll get more into blackjack um, later in the course when we talk about reinforcement learning. But not all of our games are that easy. Okay, we can't always have a one-to-one -one mapping between possible states and possible actions, or indes indices, sorry states to indices in our lookup table. So for games with non-tabular structures, meaning it doesn't just easily map into a table like that, how can we compute the index for a state? So one way is to come up with some crazy custom hash function for every different game that they play. But that could be really time consuming. And then we would have to like mathematically prove that all of these hash, hash functions are nicely uniform or they're non-reversible or whatever. And that could, that could take a lot of time. And they may also be expensive to compute. And so you wouldn't want to like play chess one day and come up with one hash function and then play checkers and then come up with another hash function and have to prove all these properties, et cetera. So what I'm going to show you here is this idea of a Zobrist hash function. And this may not be super intuitive at first, 
Um, I don't think I'm going to ask anything on the exam about the Zobrist hash function. This is more of, um, how can I explain this? For me, this is like <laughs> the Zobrist hash function. It's like a, how do I describe it without being too, it's like a, an edible, okay? You look at it and you're like, oh, that doesn't, like, that's nothing. But then like two hours later, you're like, oh, wow. Like, that's amazing. Like, when you actually go to use it, you know, at first you don't really understand, you don't get it. But then later on, you're like, oh, okay, that's powerful. So, yeah. Um, so that's the only way I knew how to describe it. Um, so Zobra's hash functions are often used in games. There's uniformity that's ensured by the algorithm. They are very fast to compute, very, very fast. And they can be incrementally updated Actions can be reversed, all sorts of cool properties. And so, for example, we could take this chessboard and produce an integer. Okay? Now, it turns out that the number of possible chessboards is larger than the number of integers. So we're still going to have hash collisions, but at least we have a hash function that can take an arbitrary game and map it to a state. So it's going to rely on two major components. One of them is a table of random values. And the second is the XOR operator, which is a bit hashing technique. Let's talk about what XOR is first. XOR is a bit operation, so it works on bits. So XOR, so if you have OR, right, if either of your operands are 0, it's a 0. If any of them are a 1, OR would produce 1. With AND, both of them would have to be 1 to produce a 1. With XOR, it basically says, are they different? If they're different, produce a 1. If they're the same, produce a 0. So if we have this value, 100101, and we XOR it with 010101, we go through each bit and we say, if they're different, produce a 1. So here, 10 produces a 1. 01 produces a 1. 0, 0 is a 0, 0, 0 is a 0, 1, 1 is a 0. So if they're different, produce a 1. If they're the same, produce a 0. XOR is insanely powerful. So um, let's say we have this value is A, this value is B, and the XOR of those two values are C. So we can see that XOR, if we XOR anything with zeros, it produces itself, right? Because all the ones XORed with zeros become ones, and all the zeros XORed with zeros become zeros. We also have the property that anything XOR itself becomes zero. So that's a cool property, because of course, if they're the same, they're going to produce a zero. So if A XOR B equals C, we, know, we also know A XOR A equals zero, a XOR 0 equals A. So we can do things like A XOR A XOR B. Well, A XOR A is 0, and 0 XOR B is B. Right? So we can make, we can, we can, we know these things without having to compute them. And it's also transitive. So A XOR B equals C. That means C XOR A equals B, and C XOR B equals A. This is essentially means it's reversible. Right? So if I take this C and XOR it with B, I get back to A. It's a reversible function. OK. So the XOR operator is reversible, which is extremely important. So how does this all relate to the Zobris hash function? Um, let's take chess as an example. So our initial hash state, our hash value for an empty board is going to be zeros. Now, I'm only using six or seven. I can't, what is that, one, two, three, four? Why do I use seven bits instead of eight? Anyway, I'm just using a number of bits that was easy for me to write on the slide. Typically, you would have a, like 256 bits or something like that. What we do is we generate a random integer for each board position. And then for each position, we generate a random integer for each piece. What that means is, so. If we have a white queen on A7, we have a random integer associated with that. 
If we have a black knight on b4, we have a random integer associated with that. So for every space on the board, for each possible value, sorry, for every space on the board, for each possible piece that could be there, we have that many random values that we've stored. And they're random values, you compute them once at the beginning and you store that in a table somewhere. So our random table R is going to be 64, that's the number of, piece, the number of places, so the number of pieces, the number of places on a chessboard, that's 64. 12 is the number of different pieces that could be at each place. Six different pieces, two different colors is 12. So our R indexed by the position, indexed by piece, means that this piece is at that position. So if we want to put a piece on the board, we can take our original hash value and XOR it with R position piece. So if I start with a blank board and I put, let's say my, my uh, black rook at A4, I'm going to put that on the board. So now that's the only piece that I have. I look up the value for that. Let's say it's 7. Then I'm going to take H, XOR it with 7, and now my value is 7, which means that I have a board with one, that piece at that particular location. If I want to remove that piece from the board, I do the exact same operation, which is to XOR it with that value of that piece at the board. So I put the piece on the board, I XOR it with a value. If I take it off, I XOR it with the same value. And because XOR is with itself is zero, then now the blank board is zero again. So what you do is you have all these values, you XOR them together. So for each piece on the board, you look that up. So it's just you iterate through all the pieces on your board and you say, look up the value of this piece with this color being at that square and you XOR all of those together. And then that's your hash value. So every time you make a single move, you XOR it with, you, you taking a piece off the board and then you're putting it in a new location. So you XOR it once and then XOR it again and your hash function is updated. And that will give you a unique integer. Well, there are still hash collisions, but it will give you an integer that's associated with a particular board of a game of chess. The very last thing, so I know that like, you're like, what the hell does that mean? But if you ever go to implement something like this, you'll then, you know, that's, that's the, the moment where you'll be like, oh wow, this is insane. But we're not gonna do that in this.